Right, well, you all know me. <coughs> Um, right, today's subject is governance, which I think most of you have begun to get an inkling that's one of the things that's my greatest passion, the one thing that's most interesting to me, because it ties together everything that you're doing. Because we can define governance as doing the right thing in the right way, the right time, the right place, to the right quality, the right cost. And you can add the right things as long as you like to the list. We can do it at government level, at nation level, internationally, inside organisations, and inside IT, computer science. Whether it's games, networks, security, forensics, medicine, everything is subject to the idea of governance. And you've all seen something happen in the last week, haven't you? Well, you've seen two things happen in the last week, which again bring the focus right back to the whole concept of governance. RBS, NatWest, Ulster Bank, their customers have had failures. They've not been able to get access to their money. Hole in the wall dies. RBS NatWest had a problem last week or the week before when they were uh, subjected to a denial of service attack and they didn't have in place the things that were obvious they should have had in place to mitigate the effects of such a thing. They should have had it years ago. There's another one, like a couple of years ago. Yeah. And then there was that catastrophic crash last year when they did all sorts of things that their internal policies told them they shouldn't do. And what has affected you guys in the last week? Turn it in. Yep. Catastrophic failure of an international service which has affected huge numbers of students in the UK, perhaps a million, maybe two million students have been affected these last four or five days. Not just in the UK, but around the world. And Turnitin have had this problem every end of semester for the last three, four years. That's kind of painful. They, which is very painful, you see. It affects you guys, stresses you out unbelievably. You can't submit at the date, the time. It stresses us out because now we have had, for some students, to delay the submission point by another week. Now, if all the universities in Britain are phasing back submission point, what's going to happen? All the affected students are going to spend an extra week, very sensibly, honing their assignment better, aren't you? You aren't going to submit it the next day it comes free just because you think you finished it. You'll use that extra time to submit it a week, on, week tomorrow rather than by tomorrow. So what's going to happen to turn it in next week? It's going to get a huge load. It'll get a huge load next week, won't it? <laughs> so has anybody thought of what's going on or what the consequences are? They haven't thought of the second order or the third order of the consequences. If this happens, then that happens, and if that happens, then that happens. The second, the third order. And one of the problems with so many of the problems we have is people never bother to think about second or third order consequences. It's so much easier to stop at the first order consequence, think about that one, and then leave those other ones as, oh, unanticipated issues, unanticipated consequences. Unforeseen circumstances. Unforeseen circumstances, rubbish. Almost all of those unforeseen circumstances that managers, managers <coughs> staff, senior management, executives, politicians, they like to have that lovely get-out clause, unforeseen consequences, unforeseen circumstances. Yeah. I grant you that part of the credit crunch in September 2008 was somewhat unforeseeable. Most of it, however, was foreseen by many, many people. 
but nobody wanted to get off, get out of the dance while the music was playing. They had to stay in there doing what they were doing. Organizations want change because of the global economy, the global village. Change is happening faster and faster all the time. We must respond to the faster changes. Otherwise, we won't be able to cope. We won't be able to stay ahead of our competitors. And so they create crazy timescales with ridiculous budgets, with ridiculous levels of resources. It is obvious that they are going to fail. And yet, they go ahead with it. Business process re-engineering, which is the foundation for enterprise resource planning uh, introduction. They're, you know, they're great systems that cover everything a company does. For the last 15 years, these sort of programs have been introduced <coughs> with an 18-month time frame. No, very, very few ERP system implementations and based on business process re-engineering have ever actually gone in on time to budget to the accepted delivery of functionality and benefits. We have not learned. We don't want to learn, apparently. And yet, IT, we spend... Five, $3 trillion a year <coughs> around the world on information, computer, communication, and technology. If we use the Standish Group uh, metrics of uh, successful, challenged, and failed projects, which has been there since 1994 when they published the first of their chaos reports, the level of successful projects, i.e. on time, to budget and delivering the sign for functionality, has moved very slightly up from about 25% in 1994 to last year, a little blip as high as 35%. The year before, 32%. And it's kind of a little bit of a sawtooth now. Challenged somewhere in the 40% late, over budget, and typically delivering about 40% of the designed, intended functionality at project launch. That functionality was intended to deliver the benefits that would pay for the project. So we give you 40% of the functionality. Is that going to pay for the project? The remainder, 25, 30% of projects are failed. They never get implemented. The money might just as well be burnt in a bonfire or turned into a magical pyrotechnics display, which would at least, because it's rather cheap to produce fireworks, would have generated far more employment around the world than the expensive resource called IT. It is easy to justify between 200 billion and 500 billion direct loss of value. Of that 3 trillion, one sixth probably is wasted straight out. If you then look at the ongoing consequences to the companies affected, the workarounds are necessary in terms of the business the extra people who are needed to keep the thing running. It is not difficult to justify another adverse hit on the value of IT <coughs> somewhere between half a billion, half a trillion, sorry, and a trillion. So I would suggest that in terms of governance, IT is probably the least effective way of spending the companies and the shareholders' money of any industry in the world. It has destroyed more shareholder value, more corporate value, than any other industry. Far worse than the financial services industry 
in 2000 to 2008 and onwards. Far more than the failed ethics and failed governance associated with the mis-selling of various financial services products in the UK and in other work countries. Yes, those companies, whether it's RBS <coughs> or Lloyd's or any of the big banks who sold those interest rate hedges to small businesses, who didn't really understand what they were getting, nor did they understand the adverse consequences if interest rates change in the wrong direction. The thing that companies are now busy thinking about suing the big banks big time. That's going to lose them billions out of their profit. Because of a failure to do the right thing for the right reasons at the right time in the right place with the right quality. The IT supply side. The guys you guys, that many of you guys are going to work for are failing catastrophically in delivering high-quality, stable, well-tested products. I was talking to various people at that conference I went to in Las Vegas, the IBM Information on Demand 2013 conference. Of all the people I talked to in the intervals, no one disagreed with the proposition that IT today all those products, those apps we use on our smart devices, our mainframe systems, our server-based systems, they have never been so fragile in the last 50 years. They are more unreliable and they cause more stress. We know from research that has been carried out over the last 18 years, starting with Rosen and Wheel in 1995, when they started looking at the concept of technostress and technophobia. And Doug Rose and his wife, Michelle Weil, they were looking from the psychological perspective, what can be done to help people who feel stressed by this new technology? Bear in mind, in 1995, it's mainly mainframed, a bit of PC stuff. The early days of more general use of IT, and yet they found up to 30% of the populations they surveyed were showing mild, medium, or high levels of stress in using the IT, whether it's in teaching or elsewhere. And that number stayed fairly constant for something like 10 years. One or two surveys, and which have been reported in the, pre in, in the academic press, uh, have shown, or did show, up to about 2007, fairly constant but slightly rising levels of stress <coughs> in the IT. Got a slight inkling in 2010 or 11 when one of my master's students did some research in Malta. Malta is interesting because it's one of the leading countries in the world in implementing e-government. The provision of those services which we can interact with the government, you know, pay our ta uh, taxi taxes, pay our um, car road fund license and get our uh, disc within five days or less by clicking online because they managed to connect to our, the insurance companies and to the MOT people. Some of it works a treat. I mean, that's one service which we have to praise for working really efficiently. DVLA have really got their act together and produced a brilliant piece of work. But Malta are way ahead of any country in the world. And one of my students was working in one of the ministries, and he did a survey of something like 150, 200 people. And we got the first inkling that the levels of stress were rising, which is, in a sense, counterintuitive. One might have thought that with all that IT that we're using, whether it's on our terminals, at, on PCs, at work, you know, we're using Office, Microsoft Office, or Open Office all the time. We're using email. And we've got these functional systems which help us do our work, the workflow management systems. And yet, so we're using them all the time. Shouldn't we be, shouldn't we be getting used to them? <coughs> shouldn't we kind of know how they work and be able to model them in our heads so we can predict how to use it. These so-called intuitive system designs. But no. They're 
group of employees inside that ministry in Malta was showing a rise compared with those early days of 1995 to uh, 2005. So last year I commissioned something like eight students to look at what's happening with technostrats. <coughs> Two of them obtained really decent sample sizes, about 200 250 uh, responses in each of their two surveys. One inside one of the hospitals in Derby, in the Hospital Trust, and one a wide international uh, social network uh, survey. And what they found was truly scary. Remember, these, this survey was an electronic survey, an online survey, which reached out to people who were using email, were using things like Facebook, and the other social networks, so they could be got at easily. We did no paper-based surveys of people who don't use, don't use email very much. The other students didn't get such good uh, size of the sample, but in total we had something like 650-odd responses across those five dissertation projects. Overall, People using social networks and email and PCs at home and all of that sort of thing, and at work, 86% of that whole sample was showing some level of stress in using IT. One of the two big samples, the one that was done outside of the hospital, the stress level, the number of people showing signs of stress was, would you believe, 95% of that survey. 95% of people find use of IT stressful for some reason. I've got 12 students now working on it, on the same project, using that same Rosen Wheel survey uh, as the first part of their tool to find out how each respondent is responding in terms of stress levels, and then they are each choosing a set of an additional 20 or so <coughs> questions to try to diagnose what is it that is causing these levels of stress. We found a rather interesting PhD thesis from 2007, which didn't refer to Rosenwheel at all, which is curious, but was looking at causes of stress. And he came up with about half a dozen or, or so different classes of things that might be causing stress. And these students are again going to try and find out, <coughs> what is it? Is it because the IT is so unreliable? Is it because it keeps changing? Is it because it's not intuitive? Is it because the interfaces keep changing and they're different between different apps? We just don't know yet. Or is it because people around me are so irritating on using their mobile phones for SMSs and texts and emails all the time? Even at dinner, you know, you've gone out to a restaurant. If I go back just a few years, the idea of going out for a meal with a group of friends to a restaurant was to talk to each other and enjoy good food or good booze or something. Now what happens? Two people walk into the pub, sit down, get a beer, and just look at their phones, then walk off. Yeah, we how most people have their phones out all the time, just sitting like that, and they're going like this, and so like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what did you say? Or how many of you, before you go to bed at night, the last thing you do before you switch the light out is a quick check of any. Have I got any more messages? Yep. I sent emails. How many of you wake up in the middle of the night because of <coughs> your mobile phone or smartphone has suddenly bleeped at you to say there's a message or something? <laughs> How many of you actually put your phone on silent or switch it off or leave it in another room? Oh, wow. I just don't know where it is. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, that's fair, do you? But yeah, about 25, 30% of you get rid of it and leave it so you can have a good night's sleep. It's, 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 it's also your alarm clock. And how many of you know how to set the, um, your smartphone into a, a quiet mode between your, during your sleep? 
Oh, you can use an app called Tasker on Android. Yeah, exactly. okay, uh, so about a third of you. Mm. So there's that sort of thing. The irritation of other people being so rude that they will stop in the middle of a word and look at their machine. That may not be stressful to you, but by golly, it's stressful to a lot of people around you. So is it the way we use it, the way we're in contact with work and play and, and learning 24-7? cannot get away from the thing. We don't know. But along with the fragility, the supply side is not testing software and apps adequately. Well, that's what I noticed with SDLC. They were moving testing away more in favour of support. It's true. SDLC, the system development life cycle is now saying, oh, well, we won't bother with the testing. It's too expensive. We can't do it properly. And we'll put it into support. So it's out there, and it's breaking, and it's breaking. Wow. Yep. There is a completely different way of looking at it, which puts testing at the very beginning. You design <coughs> the thing, taking account of all of the test scenarios you've got to prove. Behavior-based design. Do you think about testing at the very, very beginning? Who, ha who has been affected by the latest Samsung cock-up with the, them trying to send out Jenny Bean as a, uh, to their Samsung or their S3s? Has anybody been affected by that? Anyone owned an S3? Anyone owned an S3 is another question, obviously. But yeah, apparently a month or a month and a half ago, they started the upgrade and a large number of these rather expensive smartphones turned into bricks. Yay! 25, and I saw one tweet or one email complaining, here's a five, six, seven hundred quid piece of electronics, and I'm paying 25 quid a month plus for my uh, contract, and I can't use it. That's information on demand out in Las Vegas. IBM got a very, very red face because they're the people they commissioned to build a little app that goes onto iPads and iPhones to help you build your agenda for this enormous conference with up to 50 parallel sessions at any given time. <coughs> you could select the ones you wanted and build them into your agenda and have it there as an agenda. They didn't test the distribution mechanism or didn't test the way the app worked. It loaded, yeah, you switched it on, you got the flash screen at the foot to say I'm coming alive, and you got a beautiful white screen. And that's what it did. Something hadn't been tested. They found this out on the Saturday or the Sunday, needed to get it fixed by the Monday or the Tuesday, bear in mind the conference finished on a Thursday. gave a short time scale, they couldn't get through the security validation processes for the iTunes um, distribution mechanism, so they had to come up with a genius approach. What do you do, folks, I discovered uh, when I happened to bump into the people who made it, I couldn't find their stall. Well, Richard, what you need to do is to change the language setting for your iPad to US English. So I do. And if you do that, kill the app, <coughs> and then fire it up again, it will tell you it's got an update. You change the language setting to trigger an update. Wow. That took me, because when, has anybody ever tried changing the language setting of an iPad? It takes half, an hour, half a minute with a black screen. You do not know what is happening. Yeah. You think, oh, I've got a brick. But actually it worked. And it fired up. How come they hadn't found that? Because they only tested on US iPads. They tested on USI, well, not just that. <coughs> How come they found it wet white screened when it first ran? They must have done some testing somewhere, surely. <laughs> they might have done it with US iPad, but if they use the US language setting to trigger the download of the upgrade. Yeah, so they only tested it. Well, no, it, it was before that to getting the white screen which says app failed. How come you get onto iTunes an app that white screens for everybody? Well, obviously, every iPad they put it on must have been American. If Apple are testing it, they would have used American on the as well. 
But even the Americans were having problems with white screen. <laughs> so you guys need, as IT computer scientists, whether you're in games or network security, forensics or whatever, if you're involved in those activities, you need to start thinking about how do we ensure our products are adequately tested all the way through the design process. We cannot afford the irritation and the loss of reputation. I mean, what's Turnitin's reputation going to be like now? Pretty abysmal. Well, pretty abysmal. It's getting worse, that's for sure. It hasn't yet sneaked out into the news media, as far as I can see. I've not seen any reports that the news in the UK or USA have found this problem. Let's Google it. I found one about two days ago. I put Turnitin problems into Google and found the Twitter feed from Turnitin, which said, oh, we've got a little bit of an issue at the moment. Um, it was alive and it's dead, and it's alive and it's dead, and so on. And I found one university in the UK, uh, which was Portsmouth University, where we could see the message out to students, hey guys, we've got a problem, please don't worry, we're extending the deadline by 24 hours. Yeah, in the scale of things, affecting, potentially affecting two and a half million students in the UK who may or may not be trying to submit at the moment, and around the world, I don't know how many students go into that. This is in a different class, a different scale of upset to the RBS Nat West issues, which only affects a couple of million people. This is much more serious. And they've been doing it for years. And they've been doing it for years, and they still do not have scalable architecture which will cope with the foreseen loads in particular weeks. All right, let's face it. When I put up on uh, Turnitin your submission point, I identify the date and the time when the uh, submission point will close. Now, I know as well as you do that about 2% are going to put it in a day or two early. The vast majority of you will work up to that last moment. So if it's 59 minutes past 11 <coughs> in the evening on a Friday, I assume that there's going to be about 60 or 70% of you are going to be trying to submit it in the five minutes before it closes. Am I right? Mm, depends on the assignment. Depends on the assignment, yeah. I, mean, I know one or two do like to submit a bit earlier. But not many. So turn it in as an organization actually has inside their databases a complete profile of all of the submissions. They have a reasonably good perspective of how many students they're expecting to submit for each submission point. And they haven't used that facility to pre-plan their capacity, their, their growth burst, and then contract it. Why not? That is a gross failure of competence, it's a gross failure of governance. I've made my infrastructure costs, reluctance to put it in. There's a good point. Money costs. Well, we're already spending $3 trillion a year, which is five, over 5% 5 of world GDP is spent on ICT. Yeah, we're wasting half of that, perhaps, getting zero value from it. So, both sides, the users and the providers are culpable in these failures of governance in terms of providing useful, valuable ICT. But it comes into interesting focus when you look at the UK Companies Act 2006. And there's a nice little section there, section 176 I think it is, which defines the responsibilities of corporate directors. It is a set of uh, ideas, <coughs> objectives, which are shared across pretty much all of the Anglo-Saxon uh, world. <coughs> US, Canada, UK, and I would guess almost certainly sub-Saharan Africa, 
Australia, New Zealand. I guess they all have pretty much the same thing. What is interesting about this particular section of the, of the Companies Act is that in that particular section, there is no mention of the resp any responsibilities to shareholders. Because if you go and ask any corporate director who, to whom are your primary responsibilities, to whom are your responsibilities at all, almost all of them are going to say to the shareholders. Makes sense. In actual fact, that section of the UK Companies Act 2006 is absolutely spectacular. There is no mention of shareholders at all. The first responsibility is to consider the long-term survival and objectives of the company. The second one is very interesting. It is to consider the interests of the employees. And then the remaining sections move outwards to other state responsibilities to consider the uh, interests of other stakeholders and then the community and uh, outwards to the nation, the suppliers, the um, customers and so on. Does it not make a difference if, uh, if the company is international or not though? So I know under, well, under American corporations they have a fiduciary responsibility for their shareholders. They have some, and there's some fascinating debates going on in there. And if you read uh, my paper that I presented to the PRI Seaburn uh, PRI conference in Toronto in, when was it, a year ago, in, in early October a year ago, I covered some of the debate about shareholder responsibilities and the duty of care and a whole range of things about uh, directors. But they still have, in American law, the same perspective that, that duty of care to the, chef, the employees is significant. Now, the point I want to bring back is to come, not quite full circle, but to come back around to the point I was making about technostress. We know that stress is bad if it gets high. If it's low level, it kind of keeps people awake and performing. <coughs> but you push stress levels too high and they get ill. Now, if we are getting, I think the number was about 50% of the population we surveyed last year, <coughs> well, early this year, should I say, 50% <coughs> are showing medium to high levels of stress with using the ICT. And let's su su uh, suggest that some of that is to do with the unreliability, the difficulties of uh, using ICT, uh, the fact that it breaks, that it doesn't do quite what you thought it wanted to do. It doesn't do what you want because that was cut out to make it um, cost uh, for affordable. But we still have to do those tasks because the world isn't going to accept your IT doesn't do what I need it to do. So I have to do a workaround. There is here a rather interesting corporate governance issue of the ethics of forcing our staff students, everybody else, to use stuff that breaks, particularly if it causes health issues. Because that's detrimental productivity. Because health issues are detrimental to the operation of the company, health issues are detrimental to your employees. So I would suggest that there is here a very, very interesting and very important corporate governance and ethical question about the pervasive enforcement of the use of IT. into the field of what's going on, the next big issue in informatics and co uh, computer science is the field of big data. Who's heard of big data? How many know what its, its definition? Yeah. It's subject to the three Vs. Big data is those sort of set collections of data which come at enormously high rates of velocity, huge volumes, V for volume, and where it's highly variable, it could be structured, it might be unstructured, or we may need to trawl through both structured and unstructured data text and databases. Twitter feeds are quite an interesting area because they come at enormous speeds if you're looking at interesting events like, for example, the Olympics. Huge numbers of Twitter feeds all the time. 
And during the Olympics in London la uh, last year, one or two company organizations were actually capturing all of that and pouring it through uh, analytical systems like SAS, the one we're <coughs> bringing into the UK university at the moment. <coughs> and we've got installed on all of our machines in the specialist labs that you can all get at, by the way, through the S drive. You can get all of the formal teaching material that SAS give everybody who wants to learn SAS, and it contains all of the examples of SAS code, the SAS data, everything. So if you want to get start thinking about using this magical language of SAS, you can actually go there on the S drive, download it, folks, onto your hard drive or your memory stick or whatever, so you can use it out at home or on your laptop because, you know, you can't get the S drive through the web interfaces. Go talk to Phil Lawson and he'll be able to install it on your laptop for you and give you a license for the rest of the year. But the important thing is, they, people who are looking at um, Twitter feeds with SAS, they were doing really interesting things. They had to do really interesting things to try and work out what was interesting about each Twitter feed. How did it relate to the things which are going on now, well, maybe temple timing, close to time, maybe the keyword in there or something, a hashtag or an at tag or an at something, but also they had to do semantic analysis and uh, using thesauruses and so on in real time. Pushes your server technology to the nth degree. We're bringing in a little PC, little server, well, not exactly little. Well, we have CPU computers. We have Coming in at the moment, a server which will have 256 <coughs> gigabytes of RAM. It is capable of taking a terabyte of RAM. And we will be getting access to large sets of data from SAS that has you know, typically at least 5 million rows, which is, and it's the AY, it's a huge flat table, totally denormalized, quite sparse. And we're, we're looking over the next six months to uh, develop databases of 20, 30, 50 gigabytes worth of data that you guys are going to be able to play with if you want to, to learn how to analyze and visualize data. In the UK alone, we're going to need 69,000 new analytics experts within the next four years. So it's potentially stunningly powerful, but we have to think about the ethics of what we're doing. Because there are some questions which ethically we should be considering should never be asked. We should never pose them to our data. <coughs> there was an incident last year, which I think I mentioned earlier on, uh, this, this term, the company, a big supermarket chain in the States, and you can find the evidence easily in a couple of articles uh, in American newspapers last year that looked at what had happened. They were looking to, they asked their team of 20 big data, data scientists, data analytics uh, experts, is there a way that we can identify through the data we have, and the data we have access to, to consolidate, can we find ways of targeting certain groups of people and catch them, so that not only they come to buy their usual things here, food, but maybe we can catch them for some of the other things. Yes, we do sell everything, but we know that most of our customers go to that supermarket over there, a different brand, for their food, this another company for their hardware and their gardening things, and another one for clothes and so on. And yet, everything's there. And they found, while they were doing this data analysis, that they could identify pregnant women from their buying patterns and from various other data that they've consolidated. It was so creepy. So creepy, says someone. Absolutely. Now, they then, they were looking really to catch people, women in their second trimester, so say months four to six of their pregnancy. And the neat idea they had was that, okay, we can now start targeting them 
four, six months from now when little Spoglet arrives, and get them used to the idea that all of their maternity stuff and all the baby care stuff is also here, as well as the food that they come to see us for. So we'll target them with some adverts or some discount cards and offers and so on. And then they thought, hmm, well, probably we ought to kind of disguise the fact that we're targeting pregnant women, so we'll give them a few extra random offers, you know, things like uh, lawn mowers and one or two other random things, just so it's not quite so obvious. Because they, even they recognise that women would find it a bit creepy to just have, you know, I'm four months pregnant and suddenly I'm getting ad, uh, discount offers and vouchers and so on for baby things. That would be real creepy. <laughs> they thought they had done a totally wizard job. The company thought, this is wild, it's brilliant, it's magic, we've really got our customers in. And then it all, the sky fell in. I mean, they're so proud about it, they actually got some of the newspapers in the States to come and talk to the data analysts, the data scientists, to learn how brilliant they had been. They were actually in the labs, in the offices, and showing off everything. Then the sky fell in. A really angry man turned up one day at one of their branches, demanding to see the store manager. Seriously upset that his daughter, who was about 16 or 17, I think at the precise age, was being targeted with some of these adverts. What were you doing? Are you trying to make her pregnant? He didn't know what had happened. The store manager, obviously, ever so apologetic, and phoned up a few days later to have a discussion, by which time that man had had a little discussion with his daughter and had discovered the truth. Oh dear. That's he caused a family feud. We didn't cause a family feud, I don't know. The evidence I don't see the evidence in the report. Nothing is mentioned about that. So a computer program guessed it for anybody else did. It was actually they had discovered that they could predict pregnancy from the data they got access to before the woman even knew she was pregnant in some instances. Wonderful creepy. So the question, that illustrates an interesting question. Oh, by the way, the company involved locked down and now denies that it had ever happened, apparently. Sounds American to me. But there is the evidence of two articles in newspapers, Washington Post and one other, still accessible on the internet. So it did happen. Now that raises in really interesting uh, terms. One question that perhaps we should never have even considering posing to our data. What other ones are there? I mean, for example, at the moment, within the English uh, jurisdiction, insurance companies are not allowed to take into account genetic uh, details, DNA type of sampling, in terms of setting insurance. Yes, they can do crazy things like ignoring statistical differences between male and female. That's happened in the last year or so. I thought it was EU regulation. It's sort of, it's a sort of mishmash between European and UK uh, regulations and standards and everything else. And yet the statistics for giving women, young women particularly, much better insurance terms for their car insurance, for their health insurance. She does wheels, yeah. No, the statistical evidence is so, so clear there. What's going on, guys? Now, to draw to a close, we're very nearly finishing. What I would like to leave with you is to think about the program that you're on. I don't really mind whether it's games, which suffers from problems of addiction, there are people out there who, with the games that you're trying to create, which are compelling <coughs> and interesting, causes addiction. Security <coughs> networks. What has been going on? Think about all those leaks about what is now technically feasible. Think about that brilliant approach 
to sucking vast amounts of data out of the network wires. Do you know why it was called PRISM? Presumably because it is easy to put a little PRISM into an optic cable and split it into two beams. One going on where it's meant to be going on, one goes on into the recorder. Because you couldn't do that electronically, digitally, in a digital switch. You can only do it easily, like it was done, using fibre optical splitter. It costs you nothing apart from a little downtime while suddenly the, the cable stops working, split, split it, <coughs> plug two, do up two new little connectors with a third connector into your recorder, bingo. That, that is genius. I thought that was due because Kim and I and several others have been wondering how would all of this stuff that's going on to tap stuff, the proposals to tap everything or to record everything and, and so on, you can't do that in real time through the master um, routers or switches. You can if you use a beam splitter. Those of you who are involved in informatics, IT, there are ethical and governance issues in terms of how we define, specify and deliver. CS, computer scientists, programming approaches, the way that you use agile, behavior-based thinking. Those of you involved with HCI, human computer interface, think about the standards. I mean, the, universe, the people who provide the university app for many universities in this country, for um, all the environments, they are absolutely useless. They break every single convention that you have ever come across for design of an HCI, of a human computer interface. Everything is wrong. It doesn't meet the Android standards, nor does it meet the iOS standards. So all of you have got serious questions to ask about your own profession. How can we do the right thing in the right way, at the right time, for the right reasons, for the right cost, the right quality, and so on? Because you guys are going to be the people of the future in 10, 15 years' time, who are going to be trying to fix some of this appalling IT that we have around us? So think about that, guys. You've got two and a half years of study to come up with some interesting ideas as to how you can solve some of these problems by better behaviour. Thank you very much.